Yeah. Right? How You've did got- we get from BMW to orthopedic pillows? <laughs> just ask. Welcome to uh, Bad I Voltage. That- <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah, exactly. It is. We are the rambling uncle at Christmas <laughs> of podcasts. <laughs> Bad Voltage, Season 2, Episode 38. We are here, myself and Jono, and Jeremy is not here. No. The bugger's on holiday, can you believe it? He's cavorting around Europe somewhere. I know, right? Posting his fancy drinks and his posh food. (laughs) It's all, 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 all right for the other half, isn't it? So, we needed a guest presenter. Yeah, and we've done this before, and we had a look. At, we had a look around, but we've had a bunch of feedback on previous guest presenters, and one of people's favourites was. Well, hang on. Just bear in mind that everybody who we did contact was busy. Um, so <laughs> now uh, anyway, that's not on. very kind, is it? <laughs> so welcome back to the show, Alan Pope. Hello, Pope. <laughs> Hello. No pressure then. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah. There is no other option. I mean, we 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 love you, Mr. Pope. I, I um, promise not to talk about dogs' bottoms this time. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness, I'd Oops. forgotten about that. Yeah, have, uh, have Sony put out a new Ibo? No. So <laughs> since we don't have Jeremy, do we get someone else to do the and now bad voltage then? Should we get Should we I get Pope to do it? I think we should. Yeah, go on. Yeah, step up. And now, bad voltage. I think I prefer. His version, honestly. I mean, our tiny, tiny compadre is not going to be happy about that. But it was, I felt like there was more vigor and verve for, in, and in the way Vim, Pokey does it. Perhaps. Uh, maybe you could all, use Mycroft to uh, simulate me next time. If <laughs> <laughs> you ever need it again. I, I, I suspect we're now going to hear that cut in at the beginning of every intro from now on. Anyway. <laughs> I'm amazed that you're still married, given the fact that you're voice of Mycroft, because it means that your wife could provide an instruction and, you you know, it would actually follow it as opposed to the real, <laughs> the real thing. So, anyway. On, on, the other hand, on the other hand, she's now learned to not ask what beans are. So that's okay. <laughs> yeah, because I will not shut up about beans. <laughs> and he, anyone who is, is unsure about what we're talking about, go to YouTube and type in Mycroft Beans and uh, watch Popey's video. It is it is comedy gold, at least for us. Not necessarily for the Mycroft people, but it's t- certainly comedy gold for us. We're going to do a whole load of news for this show, this whole show. Um, so why don't we ask our guest to start out with some news? What yes. do you want to talk about, Mr. Pope? Oh, gosh. Okay, so the first bit of news I thought I'd raise is that Debian are having a lengthy discussion about packages which have problematic names in their distribution. And Oh, um, no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I actually heard about this because um, someone thought a bug about uh, this same package in KDE, and I looked around and turns out someone's also filed the same bug in Ubuntu, and when I pinged the person who filed the bug, they said, have you not seen the conversation on the Debian mailing list? And then I stupidly went looking for it. And sure enough, there's a lengthy conversation about the fact that there's a bunch of applications in Debian in the archive that have actually been there a long time. And they have boobs and other words in the name of the application. Right. It's pretty puerile and pretty base. Right. Uh, yeah. But they are there. And they're now having a lengthy to and fro about whether to remove them and whether it's the right thing to do to remove them or not. Right. And is it because of the name? Is that the reason for removal? It's because of what they're called as opposed to what they do? Pretty much. I mean, functionality-wise, they do something useful, right? But it's the names. and And most of them are pretty along a similar line. They've got... Things like boobs and hand job and stuff like that. that it just make it's just oh god, yeah. Twelve-year-old oh, me would probably have been mightily impressed, and hilarity would have ensued when I in you know did a first search for ob or something, and this thing showed up. I'd gone oh boobs, but forty-five-year-old yeah. me, yeah, not so. Are they in a similar way that typing you know boobs into a calculator when you were at school was hilarious at the time? 
you know, where you right. turned it upside down, it said boobs, but then, uh, but then you, but, you discover other forms of more interesting comedy. I but think my calculator I, isn't a software repository used by millions. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's, I think, a show ti- that's a show title. <laughs> 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 Maybe it runs on a calculator. Um, they, um, I think th- there is a package called the fuck, and what it does is it, it's it's for correcting uh, errors. So you type in a command. It's a terminal program, right? You type in a command and get one of the things wrong. Like you type um, git push, but you spell push wrong. Um, then the next command you type fuck push. And it corrects the previous command. It's really quite clever. And oh, I see. It never occurs. So, so it looks at what the previous command was, works out what it was you meant to correct, and then corrects it. It's quite neat. And at no point did the name of that bother me. Because, I mean, the important word that Alan used there is puerile. It's yeah. not that the names are offensive. It's that it makes the whole free software community sound like a bunch of sniggering 14-year-old schoolboys. Isn't right. Purell that's free software phone that came out? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's just been delayed, actually. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the Purell Librem 5. They're going to be super cross that you said that. <laughs> it was a joke, people. Right. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, so are these names actually a problem? Yeah, I think they are, but I don't think it's a free speech issue. I'd have no problem with someone packaging a thing called the fuck and it being in there. I can absolutely imagine that software um, software center maybe has a little tick box somewhere saying don't show things with swear words in the name, so you can give the thing to your seven year old kid or whatever. That's a whole separate discussion. But I don't know things which just make the whole community look like sniggering schoolboys i think there's a there's a it's different for each of these examples and this is these are not the first examples of applications with stupid in inverted commas rude names because i realize different people will have different definitions of what rude is right and yeah the fact exactly. that there's this thing called fuck or whatever that's just a word right okay it's a word that has meaning and yeah. can be used in certain contexts like aggressively or amusingly but the applications in this case where they're all sexualized and they're all uh, very much the kind of thing that school kids would would find funny and n- probably, I'm guessing, not as amusing to women. Yeah. And I think that's the bigger problem. Not the fact that they're rude words or the fact that it's profanity, but it's just childish crap. What's, that, what's interesting that's exactly to me the is point. that, yeah. I mean, I remember, God, it was years ago. It's probably like over 10 years ago. There was, when I was at Canonical, <clears throat> in the earlier days of me being at Canonical, there was something about, I think it was some application that like scraped, you know, erotic images off the internet and... Uh, I forget what it was called. Sex something, I, I think it was. And was it there was a whole. Just make a note of that. What was it? And uh, <laughs> there was there was something. There was there was some application that was in the Debian archive that basically scraped porn off the internet or like soft porn off the internet. And there was a whole discussion about whether that was okay or not in Debian. And I didn't really keep up with the discussion, so I assumed that they'd come to some kind of conclusion. But I'm assuming that that hasn't reached a conclusion that's why this is kind of cropping up again because to me there is a difference between the naming of something and the kind of content that it's pulling out. I, I can understand not necessarily wanting kids to get hold of applications that can pull in porn for example like and there browser. is of course and there is there is of course like the whole separate question around you know there is there is one thing which is porn, and then there is a separate thing which is you know hate speech or hate material or you know and like Poby says, everyone yeah. draws the line in different ways. Exactly, you know, and, so. and if you open the door to banning stuff like that, then you get a whole bunch of people who say, but there shouldn't be Bible apps in the Debian archive. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. but that's not this discussion at all. This no. is, yeah. I think. Uh, exactly as exactly as Alan says, uh, the, these things like this, they are at best childish and cast the whole community in a bad light, and at worst, offensive specifically to women, to new people wanting to join the community. And there's sort of a, um, a give and take thing going on here, where the deal is no one will complain and whine at you about free speechy issues around your app if you want to publish it but your half of that deal is don't call a thing we boob 
right? Just don't. Don't be like that. Yeah, but you can't stop that, can you? you So you can either... There's always going to be, in the same way that we've all experienced, in many cases, time and time again, when you're at a conference or you're in a bar or you're at a restaurant or you're at a social event, and there's always that one guy who makes jokes that are just... They're just cringeworthy. They're not necessarily hateful. They're not necessarily evil in some form. They're just really cringeworthy. Right, but that guy you wouldn't you wouldn't invite round to your house. You wouldn't exactly. You wouldn't yeah. invite to another. You probably like not give them avoid. a black mark, but you'd avoid them and you wouldn't invite them yeah. to another. This is software that's in a repository that's right. been there for years. Like it's yeah. not even. This isn't just day one of them uploading all this wondrous software with super features and then now reviewing the name. This yeah, is yeah. stuff that's been in the archive for ages. Now we're thinking, hmm, yeah. maybe maybe well, having the, second thoughts. But that, that's the tricky thing, isn't it? Is that the you in in the in the human being example? Yeah, you can basically swerve around them and avo- avoid them and just right. generally be. And we and we all do this when we go to conferences. There's certain people you just you don't want to tell them to go away, but you basically avoid and. What do you do with software? Because if you if you you can't enforce really very easily a rule that says don't name something that's childish, but then maintain other levels of free speech around Bibles and whatever else. Like I, I don't think there's a solution to this problem. Basically, you either get rid of it all or you don't. Mm. I'm, like I'm interested thing. to hear what the listeners think who maybe yes. aren't responsible, but maybe maybe have children. Maybe you know, different parents might have different perception. They might think don't really care. Or maybe yeah. they think, yes, I will fully control this. I'm interested to hear what people will say. Yeah, I mean, this is one more facet of a discussion which is going on all over the place at the moment about is a de- defending free speech is fine, but as long as people attempt to screw it up for the lols, <laughs> is it entirely beneficial, you know? Well... And what's interesting about this is that, you know, we've seen, for example, with the whole Alex Jones Infowars thing with Infowars thing with him being deplatformed, where, you know, there are some people arguing that this is an invasion of free speech. And I think most people, myself included, are saying this isn't an invasion of free speech. These platforms are deciding whether whether they, whether they want that horse shit on their platforms and they're deciding no. And, um, the, you know, that's one thing for Facebook as a as a as a company to say we don't want. Infowars, for example, but it's a separate thing for a community to because essentially Debian governance is going to have to come to a decision on this. They're going to have to say like, is this something we want or not? In my mind, if Debian say we don't want childishly named applications or we don't want overly sexualized applications, that's fine. And if you don't like it, go and use a different distro. You know? Yeah, I so. mean, Voltaire might be prepared to defend to the death your right to name a software boobs, but I'm not, and I don't think Debian should be either. <laughs> Yeah. So, next All right, what's, piece of news, what's, Mr. Bacon. All right. Well, um, did you see that Nvidia just launched some new graphics cards um, uh, called RTX? And uh, the 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 thing that people keep rambling on about these cards is that they support real time ray tracing. Um, now, this is something that's been. I'm not um, by any stretch an, an expert in anything to do with gaming or graphics cards or anything like that, but I've for some bizarre, there are certain things I just tend to keep up on uh, just because I have a, a casual interest in it. And I've been uh, keeping up on what's been going on with ray, real-time ray tracing for a while. And there's been various other cards that have attempted to do this. And one of the things that's fascinating is um, there's a video, and I put a link to this in our show preparation document that you guys can see. And maybe Aki can link I, to it I in the will, show notes. I, I will, of course, um, link to it from the show notes, yes. But it's it's basically, um, a, a, you know, Battlefield 5 is going to be the next Battlefield game. And it, it's a demo of how this, how this real-time ray tracing applies. And the example there, for example, is there's a car and there's an explosion behind a tank to the side of the car. And because the, the rays are being calculated in real time, you see the reflection of the of the um of the fire of the explosion in the in the side of the car and it's one of those things whereby does it really change the quality of the gameplay probably not but what's interesting is when you see this switched on the it does add like a pretty remarkable level of immersion and realism to it which i think is kind of interesting um what's fascinating as well is that you'd expect that these cars are going to cost you know thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars but they actually ha- apparently have some relatively low-end one which just comes in at about 400 dollars something like that so it's not just like the 
the 1080 Ti, like, you know, triple SLI kind of thing that you need for this. So I found the, yeah. uh, the video, um, the guy doing the, the presentation was more excited than I've ever heard someone be <laughs> about <laughs> illuminated pixels on a display. It, it was, it was quite, um, it's, it's a bit infomercially the way it, you kind of react. It, it did <laughs> seem rather disproportionate, didn't it? it I did. did think that. But that said, I quite enjoy playing um, games where, uh, that are quite immersive, um, open world games where you, you know, walk around, take in the atmosphere, maybe do a bit of construction, maybe shoot yeah. someone in the head, um, yeah, all kinds of things. <laughs> Just um, like real life. But sometimes when they do an upgrade to the software, um, and they introduce new effects like better reflections on the sea or better light casting so that it reflects off buildings and the the wood the material or the stone reflects in the right way it just helps your immersion in that game and i can see yeah. how someone who's playing a game where you're you know fighting the enemy and there's explosions going off left and right and you can see it reflecting in a building window or in a car or something as they do in the demo i can see how that will increase your immersion in the game and you will feel like you're there and i can imagine this combined with like vr or ar where yeah. it really feels like you're there would be an exciting development for people who are into you know high quality detail graphics i think it's fantastic and it's amazing that this stuff is coming to desktop computers at commodity yeah. prices okay high-end video card prices but still accessible you know it's yeah. it's a bonus payment or it's a you know it's um something you save up a little bit of money for maybe Christmas it's present. Not, it, yes. yeah it's not it's it's not out the realms of normal people. I think it's fantastic yeah. stuff. But, or, or, or maybe you put it on your uh, on your wish list, which mm. is um, diver diverting into a a thing we found out the other day that if you look at um, most people's wish list on Amazon, it's all small things. El Baconio de Maximo has a Marshall amp on his <laughs> for seven hundred and twenty-four dollars, which is ambitious. I'll say that, mate. I, 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 the touch that I really liked was that Amazon emailed me that and said to me, it's Jono's birthday in a couple of weeks. Why don't you buy him a present? And top of the list was that Marshall amplifier. Thanks, Amazon. Thank you, Jono. I, I tell no. you what, though, um, uh, on that note, Mr. Pope, and this is going to be this is going to make no sense to any of our listeners. But Mr. Pope sent me this, um, and it is, <laughs> it is a, to describe this, uh, the movie Ted, uh, written uh, and starring Seth MacFarlane from Family Guy, Alan sent me this uh, little bobblehead of Ted, the teddy, and it sits in my office, and oh, wow. I love it. Yeah. That's fantastic, I did not, I, and it, I didn't remember and it's that. nice, it's mainly an earthquake detection device, because when... Things start rock wobbling. His head just seems to start moving randomly. So my so. my drunken Amazon order from a couple of years ago, <laughs> when it happened to be your birthday, turned out you've, right. yeah. you've got to have something on your desk watching over you. So yours is a bobblehead of Ted. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Um, yeah, I mean, I actually that reminds me. I'm going to go and update the wish list <laughs> because obviously listeners are going to be clamouring to buy me something. Um, I'm, don't need a martial arm anymore. Got an axe effect. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm sure they are. I'm on on the real time ray tracing thing. Oh yeah. Um, yes. I don't know. Meanwhile, back at the point. Yeah. I mean, I don't know much about this because realistically, you don't need real time ray tracing for Monkey Island Two, which is the most advanced graphical game I've got. But um, the thing I didn't understand about this—they make a big deal about real time ray tracing, but doesn't it just mean this card is now fast enough to do that? Like, presumably there was a point at which they did real-time shadows rather than pre-computed shadows, but that's just, we've made a faster card and now it can do this thing. Right? I bet your assumption of graphics cards here is that a graphics card is basically a circuit board with a really fast CPU on it, right? <laughs> that's not how graphics cards work. <laughs> they, they have various technology incorporated in them for, for optimizing different types of operations. Right, so I think what they've done is I think so they, what I they've built a real-time ray tracing API that um, I think, someone can yeah. individually call to say we need to real-time ray trace this here. Do I it. think it's called off the top of my head. I think it's something like a Turing chip or something. I think it's called. Do we have a, a button we can press when none of us has a fucking clue what we're talking about? Because <laughs> I think I need to press. It. You, yeah, you we do. It's called the record button. <laughs> but, but, but what I wanted, I mean, I went and read a bunch of reviews of this, but unfortunately, this is one of those things where. 
everyone writing about it assumes that if you're reading their article, you know what's going on here. Right. Yeah. So I read through a million reviews of people uh, people talking about how amazing it was and vertexes and all this shit. And I had no idea what any of it meant. So well, also just PC gamers, just they're just a different, just species of people, like with their ridiculous racing chairs and their glowing keyboards and their LED mice. Like it just, I've already had a rant about this in a previous show when I tried to build a PC that didn't have. Horrible Blackpool Illuminations <laughs> LED shite on the inside of the case. Yeah. And it's like, oh no, you have to buy it and turn it off. Like, I know, it's ridiculous. It's like, why do I want a PC that I can see from space? And I like posh cases, right? I don't want some beige box that goes under the desk, as previously discussed. Right. But I also don't want it to look like Thunderbird 2 every time I turn it on. It's ridiculous. Funnily enough, uh, just before we started recording, I was playing Rust with uh, Will Cook, uh, your friend Will Cook, who has literally just bought a PC or just built a PC exactly like that a Ricer <laughs> gaming PC and the first thing he did was uh, install Rust and then we both jumped on a Rust server and uh, yeah that's, Rust is quite cool it is Rust yeah. is quite cool so that's oh, the that, kind that, of game where I think this kind of thing where you yeah. get that realism the immersiveness it will be, will be yeah great. I mean, okay. I, I can totally see that. As, as you say, it being more realistic means that you'll notice things like out of the corner of your eye. You know, as you said, the, the, the example of fire being reflected in a window, that's something where you don't even have to consciously react to it. You'll just be like, oh, things on fire over right. there. Take it Because it's like being in the real world. Right, and if that wasn't there then that car would look like a cardboard cutout placed in the world. It doesn't yeah. look like a car. It doesn't behave like a car. And if you can yeah. make the the lighting look like that thing is a real physical, tangible object with a surface and with, you know, bumps and dents and the doors half open and the windows half down and you see reflections, then it's going to trick your mind into thinking, you know. Yeah, I mean, I've it's, it's, like the, it's like the gaming uncanny valley, isn't it? You know, right. you, you want to yes. kind of get as close to that level of realism. And it seems like with a lot of games... Like when people are, when they're really fast paced, fast action games like first person shooters, it probably doesn't matter qu quite so much. But I think for games like Rust, where you spend a lot of time kind of like wandering around and taking it in and observing the scenery, you have the time to enjoy that kind of detail where you might not if it's, you know, mm. going like gangbusters. So. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's fascinating. I've been, um, I've been trying to learn a bit more about graphics recently. So I've been watching a bunch of videos about Blender. Um, right. I'm mostly going, damn, this is complicated. I'm never going to do any of this. But just watching them for the joy of seeing this thing get created. And it's amazing. Some yeah. of the things that people create, especially these videos where you watch it sort of sped up a bit. So you can see them just drawing a thing and then and you go, well, that looks okay. And then they suddenly turn on the um, the correct shader or whatever. And suddenly it's just bang, completely realistic kitchen. Or what? I love how you've just discovered 3D <laughs> modeling software. No, no, no. I mean, it's I was aware it existed, but I didn't well, know three, the three D Studio Max is amazing. I'm yeah. aware <laughs> electricity exists, but yeah, Hi. Dad. right. The fact that I hadn't looked into it, <laughs> it's re it's really interesting. I think. Well, yeah, you I, should we you should look at some of the promo videos for things like Unity 3D and Unreal Engine, and just look at the the, the stuff that they show you that it can do in the next version. Those yeah, are, yeah, those are quite fast. I think. I mean, quite, that's the yeah, the amazing. Uncanny Valley thing you were talking about. I mean, one of my favourite game trailers was for uh, Assassin's Creed Revelations, and there's a bit which is uh, it's the beginning bit of the game, but I don't think it's an in engine cutscene. I suspect a bunch of it was pre rendered, but some of it's. Amazing! You've got um, he's walking past a guy, and it just looks like a film. It looks completely realistic, and then there's a bit at yeah. the end where um, the guy pulls off um, uh, Ezio's hood, and suddenly now you can see his whole face. It just doesn't look quite realistic, but it just looked completely realistic when his eyes were shaded. Do you think? I don't know if we're if I'm misremembering, but I don't. I don't. Remember whether when uh, Zelda or whatever game came out on the N64 or Super Nintendo, we ever looked at the cutscenes or the video that when those 3D things came out, I thought, wow, this looks totally realistic. Is it only now that we're starting to do it's, that? I'm sure we've done this before. I, I think so. I, yeah. I, I, I think people are going, wow, that looks real. But 
It doesn't act well. The, the point is that there are some things now where I honestly believe if you took a a rendered thing and said, "Is this a photograph of a real thing, or is it a computer? Is it actually CGI, computer generated imagery?" Got to be careful here because I've been lectured to death by Captain Disillusion about how visual effects and CGI are not the same thing. <laughs> but this is actually <laughs> CGI, computer generated imagery, right? Um, there are there are some things now where I genuinely don't think I could tell the difference between a photograph and CGI, and I do not believe that was the case on the N sixty four. Right. No matter I, how much people said that's realistic, you go, which of these is a photo, which one of these is on the GameCube? They go, that one's clearly a GameCube. Image. Right. Um, you know, pointy tits, Lara Croft. I don't think at any point anyone went, wow, that's really realistic, but it was better than a 2D sprite but of Mario, right? I think yeah. the thing is, back then, I remember when I had a Mega Drive, for example, and, you know, you'd see one of these, like, little cutscenes. I'd be thinking, wow, look at the size of that sprite. How did they make that move? You know? <laughs> like, oh, wow, Street Fighter 2 Turbo Edition. Um, look at the size of the sprites. How did they make... Like, I, I think it was more the, the technology... It was more like, how do you make that technology work within that context. It's got and in four fact then, layer parallax. That's amazing. But no one's right. going, it's indistinguishable from a Tom Cruise film. Right. right. This is, like this the is... Mega CD had parallax scrolling <coughs> uh, or this, scaling. This is the problem I have with uh, modern video games. I love them and they're beautiful and I want to play them just because I, I love the technological marvel of being in the game. I'm absolutely crap at all of them and I will yeah. never finish any of them, but I just love being immersed in that, in that world. It's fantastic. This, By the way, one final thing that I know because I, when I built my little studio machine, and I, I didn't need a very decent graphics card in there, but I needed something for audio reasons that kept this like deferred procedure call rate down low. And I got like a Radeon five something, five sixty or something, which was a couple of hundred dollars. Not not particularly beefy by any stretch of the imagination. I played Battlefield One. It's the first time I played a PC game in about twenty years. Put it on. And the whole cutscene starts out, and then it gets to a point, and it looked like it had just frozen, and but the music was still playing. I could hear these sound effects, and then I realized it wasn't a cutscene. It was the gameplay, using the gameplay engine. And I was just sat there, and it was waiting for me to do something. It looked <laughs> yeah. so good. It's like, unbelievable. Oh, well, you, can right. that, you can tell that wasn't online play then, because you stood there for one second and didn't get shot in the back of the head by someone you never That's even true. saw. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah by some thirteen-year-old boy <laughs> who would inform me of my mother's sexual proclivity, um, and then presumably so, install web boobs from the Debian archive. From the Debian archive, it's a circle of life. <laughs> All right, so, so shall we move on? So, slightly more serious piece of news here. Um, yes, what's next? Now, if you buy a modern car, you get a whole bunch of um, access from your phone stuff. Um, I'm not sure if this is the case on base models, but it's certainly the case if you go and buy a BMW or a Merc or something like that, or a Jag, Jaguar or something. Right. Um, so they come with, you know, you can download the app and then you can connect it to your car and you can do a whole bunch of controlling the car and finding out information about it, so on and so forth. I don't think it's quite James Bond levels of being able to drive the car from your phone yet, but you certainly right. can find out a bunch of stuff. However, when you sell the car... You, you, you do a private sale or you sell it back to a garage or something. That stuff obviously doesn't get removed. And most of the time, nobody knows to remove it. So you sell the car and then a year later, you probably still find you can connect to it, find out where it's been, um, you know, how many people were in the car, when it was being driven, all this kind of thing. Um, there are a little thing. So if you, if you actually buy a BMW... Um, and the new owner registers the app against the car. It will automatically deregister the previous owner. But if you buy a Merc, the new owner has to ring up Mercedes on the phone to get the old owner removed if they didn't do it for them. Okay. And I just thought, I don't know, do people actually use this stuff? I don't know whether all this you can find out about your car from your phone stuff is just a stupid tick list feature that nobody actually turns on. Um, or what? And I don't own a modern car, but Jono, you've only recently bought a car, right? So presumably it well, has all this... A couple of years ago. Does it have all this whizzy rubbish, and do you use any of it? Uh, we don't have any apps for our cars, so I don't know. I mean, you, you, there's always been that... There's that 
standard interface right that you can plug something into and you can yeah, suck yeah. out of it nah, like not diagnos that. diagnostics type stuff but yeah but this is things like you can control the climate systems you can call breakdown services about the car you can right. uh, you can get all the gps and destination stuff from the built-in sat nav and so on if if you were selling a car could you not just put a usb key with dban on it and dd zeros over the hard drive or something and then, then <laughs> hand the car over oh well certainly um the, the point is that if you sell a car and you and you want to remove yourself that's not hard you just go into the app and go remove me from this car the point is that most people don't but in the same way that when people sell their laptop they don't wipe all the the data off i i picked up a second hand laptop in a charity shop a few weeks ago and the woman who previously owned the laptop, this laptop hasn't been powered on for five years. I turned it on, and there was all her photos and and documents on on the desktop. Yeah, I so mean, right. the, I I mean, don't people know. just are crap with technology. I don't think this is necessarily the car companies doing necessarily anything bad. It's just people are shit at yeah. giving something to somebody else right. and clearing up art before. This is what this is why I brought it up. Is this just a caveat emptor thing when? When you're buying a car, this is now just one more thing you probably ought to be aware of and say to the previous owner, can you unpair yourself from the car, please, if it's got that stuff? In the same way that you go, how many keys were there? If there were two, I want both of them. But yeah, there's I'd no obligation the on the happen. car company to make it easier to, to do that. If, he, if they only hand over one key and go, there was only one key, you've got no real proof that there weren't two and they haven't just kept one. <laughs> I guess once people start getting, um, like, people have smart devices in their houses, they have smart bulbs and smart home controls. I guess once those things are embedded into your house, the same thing's going to happen when you move house. You're going to leave that house and still have an app in your phone well, that can yeah. control the locks on your previous home, maybe. Yeah, totally. I mean, if you sell an an Amazon device, the name of which I'm not going to say because it'll hear me. <laughs> um, <laughs> reach over and mute mine. Yes. Can't, can't, Carry on. Can't, can't talk about the thing behind its back. It's really annoying. <laughs> um, and you don't think to unpair it before you just, un you just unplug it and then it goes to a new Wi Fi network. Does it make you re log in? Well, so I have a second hand lady cylinder uh, <laughs> on my desk. <laughs> And, um, I, 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 when I first plugged it in, it's obviously trying to reach the wireless network of the previous owner of said lady cylinder and, uh, obviously can't do that. So the first step is press a button to reset it. And oh, get it of course, to because you, you can't, you can't connect to it from the mobile app until it's yours. And it's it's you have to reset it. Oh, so that problem's actually solved for right. um, for the thing. <laughs> unless, <laughs> the unless, my, unless my network was called, like, BT <coughs> Wi-Fi, and I just happened to have bought one that had been on somebody else's network called BT Wi-Fi or something. And, and, and I had the same password or whatever. But yeah, uh, that okay, probably that, wouldn't work, but yeah. Ah, that's really interesting. So that's already <clears> solved, but... Also, if you buy a car and some of that information is left in there, I mean, with the exception of you, the GPS, tr the GPS, is, you know, trips is you wouldn't want that sharing with other people and you wouldn't necessarily want your home address sharing with other people. But in terms of all the climate control and, you know, car diagnostics and, and it, you know, where it, your no, seat position is, who cares? That's not that big a deal. Yeah. To be fair... When you sell a car in the UK, your home address is printed on a piece of paper that you give to the next owner. <laughs> yes. It's not exactly oh, really? hard yeah, to get okay. your home address. Also, I think my worry would be less uh, that data when handing the car over. I'm more concerned about the manufacturer and operator of the car. If you look at some of the stories that are coming out of the US with Tesla owners, if they take a broken tesla there's a, a few people who take uh, broken down ones crashed ones and re recover them and fix them and put new front end on them or whatever new batteries and then try and get any kind of parts from tesla and they get turned down because that car is now on a block list and you can't actually buy parts at all i saw a video there's a guy called rich repairs he's a very entertaining chap who does a lot of this and he phoned up tesla and said you know here's my vin number and all he wanted to do was buy little caps that go on the lug nuts on the wheels, and they wouldn't sell them to him because that car was blacklisted. Really? Yeah, because it was right. it had been in a crash and it had been recovered, and they have to certify, and you have to pay thousands or so of dollars to get it recertified to get it back on the road. And if they say no, 
then you've got a car that works, but you can't get any service so, from them. So wow. it, wa- it wasn't a cut and shut or anything. They're just basically no. going, unless you buy... repaired car. Or, unless you buy all stuff from us forever, we, we're going to refuse to allow you to buy any right. stuff at all. because there are only Tesla service centres. There are no third-party te- Tesla service centres. You can only go to them to get your car repaired. I'd be more, more worried about that, that my car was being <laughs> held hostage by the manufacturer. Right. And we yeah. we talked in the last show about how the FBI approached Google and said, we want to find everyone who was in this area. And Google said yeah, no, address. because they're prepared to actually push back on that kind of request from law enforcement. Are BMW or Mercedes prepared to push back on that? Not. I, I suspect um, they're nowhere near as invested in in pushing back on that kind of request. By the way, I was thinking about that, and I suspect that uh, based upon pri- my prior experience of Google and their management of YouTube, if they were ask the uh, FBI um, agents if they would be willing to upgrade to YouTube Red, and they agreed to, <laughs> they would probably provide that information. Uh, you'd Google, lo- you'd lo- YouTube, please stop it. <laughs> I don't care about your stupid YouTube Red service. Enough. Their, already. their latest trick is if you're watching a video and you like i was doing this i was doing the washing up and i started playing a video on youtube and then i locked my phone and i'm not a youtube red or premium or whatever subscriber yeah, i locked yeah. my phone and went to put it on the shelf and it stopped playing i thought oh yeah so i unlocked the phone as soon as i unlocked the phone there was a pop-up saying hey do you want to be able to watch videos when your phone right. is locked? Oh, yeah. You yeah. need to sign up to this thing. It's, like, it's infuriating that people have been moaning about the fact that YouTube won't play stuff in the background or when your phone's locked for years. And clearly, the reason it hasn't is because they thought right back at the beginning, at some point in the future, we're going to make people pay for this feature. So we're not going to give it to them now in order that we can make them pay later. But the, at no point did they ever say, no, that's going to be a premium feature, but we haven't done premium yet. They just ignored everyone's requests. Well, they have that right. They are a commercial company. They do. It's just, I'm not suggesting I mean, they're not allowed to give, do it. I'm saying they're If you give it. everybody what they want, then you don't have a company anymore. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> a revenue stream. What, they don't have to give everyone what they want, but they could have said, no, we're not going to do that because that's going to be a premium feature later. I but just think it's like, the definition of a feature that nobody wants. Like, I think most people don't particularly care about the ads because you can skip them. And... Most people don't necessarily Not want on to mobile, play things. Uh, mobile is very difficult to skip ads on. Yeah. Uh, like or, if if I'm doing the washing up and I've got a video playing, how am I going to skip the ads? Like I, my phone won't do it automatically. I've got to dry my hands and then go skip, skip. Oh, you've got to tap it, it, yeah. But and, you can do it, right? And, but it's not like a browser on a desktop where it auto-magically does all of that for you. And, I, mean, I know these do exist now. Sorry, Stuart. Yeah. I know they do exist, but it's, it's harder on mobile. Yes, but an awful... I'm experiencing quite a lot more ads which are now unskippable and 30 seconds long. Um, that's, it, that's definitely happening more. The, yeah. the, I think the, 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 the thing about the browser and stuff on mobile is that's because you're using the YouTube app on mobile rather than using YouTube in the browser on mobile because the YouTube app obviously doesn't have an ad blocker in it, not surprisingly. <laughs> Yeah, Your bra- I also ethically, as discussed previously, I yes. ethically oppose ad blockers. That's how the internet gets funded. So watch people's ads, and then the internet gets funded. But the the thing that bugs me more than anything about YouTube is just an efficiency thing. So to give to give you an example, um, Eric and I have been looking into buying one of these Peloton exercise bikes, and we've we've ordered one. And the minute I went to their website or or did something that related to Peloton, I think maybe one ad kind of appeared and I clicked on it and then it would just basically DDoS me with Peloton ads <laughs> before every YouTube, YouTube video. And it got to a point where like, I've already gone and talked to the store about this. I already understand about it. I don't want to see these ads anymore. So I'd selected, you know, the down, down vote thing um, whenever I'd see it. And it just completely ignored it in the same way that these, these freaking purple pillows for some reason, like once a while back, I looked into buying a orthopedic pillow, right? <laughs> and now I've been basically just harassed by the purple pillows people. And it's like, for them, they're, they're paying for advertising that isn't being, like, it's having the inverse effect that they want. It's well, irritating yeah. me that I see. Technically, it's now, not. I, because you're now talking about that product to, I don't know, tens of people. Tens <laughs> of people. But, but I'm talking about it in, a, in an annoyed way. And the thing is, 
The difference, I think, with us compared to, I think, most people of the planet is that we know how advertising on the internet works. So I know that it's not, I know that this is not so much Purple's issue. It's more an issue with YouTube. But the problem is, I think a lot of people like, you know, would get irritated at the brand because they're being over advertised to when they've said they, yeah. they keep skipping it or they don't like my view is if you skip something three or four times and you've pressed the downvote button three or four times it is time to officially piss off yeah right i um i mean i wish the twitter oh, bothers me. I, I wish twitter would learn that but the thing i don't get is for some people maybe literally all google knows about them is that they once looked at an ad for some orthopedic pillows and they once looked at an ad for some peloton stuff and therefore that's what they know but your whole life belongs to google yeah right? how You've did got- we get from bmw <laughs> to orthopedic pillows <laughs> 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 Welcome to uh, Bad I Voltage. That, yeah, seriously. Yeah, exactly. It is. We are the rambling uncle at Christmas of podcasts. <laughs> uh, so, pick a different, move on? Yes, pick a different piece of news. Go on, Mr. Pope. Give us something. Give us some sugar. Okay, so this is less news and more a discovery that I made. Um, there's a local Facebook group to me, which are mostly old people posting photos of how the world used to be and how it was much better back then. Most of the photos are in black and white and there are places nearby. And one of the guys posted a link, which was a screenshot. And the screenshot had two maps side by side. It was like an old map and a new map. And I looked at it and it was, I thought, ah, oh, that's, that's quite interesting. And it turns out it was um, a website, a publicly accessible website called NLS. Dot UK. In fact, the full URL is maps.nls.uk. It's the National Library of Scotland. And it's um, a library where they have lots of digitised maps of not just Scottish land, but other lands as well, including England and some bits of America. And the really cool thing, the really coolest thing on there is this side-by-side viewer where it'll put up two maps, an old map and the current overhead like Bing Um, satellite view and as you move them around and zoom in and zoom out they move and zoom together so you can get a side-by-side view of what this place looks like now and what it used to look like a hundred years ago it is super cool and i spent like three hours on it last night just browsing around looking at various places in the uk it's great it is yeah it's very interesting i I have it open in my browser right now and uh it's 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 fascinating being able to just go and compare and contrast this but yeah Go and check it out, maps.nls.uk. I even, I even bought a map. I, I was that impressed, and I thought, oh, I'll support these people. So I bought an A2-sized, like, you know, so that's four times A4 uh, map of uh, Hampshire, where I live, from 100 years ago. And last night I said to the wife, um, if I buy a picture, uh, whereabouts in the house can I hang it up? And she went, what kind of picture have you bought? <laughs> I was like, it's not nerdy. It's not geeky. It's just a nice picture. And so we're now trying to find where in the house I'm going to put this thing. I think it'll probably be above my desk right here. Is it going to be on the outside of the house? <laughs> yeah, in the facing bin. the west. It's, 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 yeah. it's going to be in the bin. In the skip across the road, yeah. yeah. Um, I, the, the, the site is excellent. I did the same thing that everyone does, which is go and look up where they live or where they grew up. Which was which was fascinating, you know, because this, um, they've actually got a whole bunch of different maps you can pick. The oldest one they've got is from sort of eighteen ninety or something, and then there's a whole bunch going up through the twenties and thirties and fifties and sixties and so on. And it's cool. One of the things it does teach you is how much better we are at mapping technology now than you were. I mean, the maps were amazing. A hundred and 20, 130 years ago, considering it was all done by some bloke with a notebook and a, yeah, lot, and a, and a lot of shoe leather. Uh, they, they, didn't have sufficient, they didn't have sufficient GPS satellites in orbit back then. <laughs> that was the problem. It was. The problem is that you know, you, you know you need four over the horizon and they never managed yeah. to get to four over no. the horizon in order to do the maps. Um, but you look at the maps now and you think, wow, maps now are amazingly detailed by comparison. You know, you zoom into where where I am. And this building was here back then. It was a it was a school back then. And the front and the frontage of the building is still original. And so you can see a building, but it's literally just a black box on the map. Whereas now if you look at OpenStreetMap or Google Maps or whatever, it's this incredibly detailed thing. And it, it but it's yeah, it's fascinating. You can see how many streets around you just weren't there in eighteen ninety. 
I um, what's I, I went yeah. around the coast and down to um, Dungeness Nuclear Power Station, which Hooray! obviously wasn't there a hundred years ago. <laughs> um, and the, it's just like all the little things that were there, and being able to like scroll along the the coastline and see. In fact, one thing that I thought was fascinating is you can see where. Um, the Coast Guard place was a hundred years ago, and where it is now, and see that the the sea has eroded the coastline away. So you can oh, see it's really? Closer. So it's sort yeah, of further inland. Well, it's not. It's obviously on the edge, yeah. but the edge has moved in. Yeah. Oh, it's, that is it's fascinating. Cool. So yeah, that's what I spent last night doing. So I just wanted to share that little discovery. No, one thing I'm fascinated by discovery. is is going over the Thames, the River Thames in London, is that pretty much all of the bridges. On it existed in 1885. London's yeah, really, really old, man. I found cities yeah. a bit less interesting than out in the sticks places, like if right. you go all the way down to like Land's End or somewhere like that. You can see these tiny little alleyways, and some of those still exist. And these ti- there's a school down way down near Land's End that um, is near where I went on holiday, and that school was there a hundred years ago. It's just yeah. yeah. Oh no, you see, I f- I found cities. To be excellent. I mean, obviously, I went and looked up Birmingham, right? And it's great to be able to look and go, okay, well, there's Victoria Square, which is still there. Oh, and there's some other building, which is now Byron Hamburgers or whatever, <laughs> and was not that in 1880. Right. But, but seeing that, just, I did actually see, and I must dig up the link for this, I saw quite a cool site where they would sell you a, a poster of a map, and it was a map done pure white background, all the streets in just pure black. So no labels or legends or anything on the map at all. Just that as an overhead view. And then the name of the city, sort of Philadelphia or whatever, in writing at the bottom. And they looked really cool in quite a um, a stark, minimalist sort of way. You can imagine having them on the wall. The problem is um, they're an American company. And the, the example maps they showed are all American cities. But if you look at British cities, they don't look as cool in that kind of map because they haven't got that right. kind of graph paper regularity. It just looks like someone got a handful of ink and just threw it at a page. Because <laughs> 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 I thought, well, oh, I'd like one of these for Birmingham. How cool would this be? And then when I looked at it, I went, oh, it doesn't look that cool at all. It just looks rubbish. Whereas, you know, you ready for an- Arizona looked interesting. Are you ready for an amazing segue? <clears throat> Do it. So, from pixels on a screen to pixels left in the back of a lift. <laughs> oh, for God's sake. Yeah, yeah, that's right. This is the, this Professional. Is, this is um, the fact that Google, have, oh, Google employees appear to have left a Pixel 3 within range of every journalist on Earth by accident. So, as I talked about on, I think it was the show before last, uh, I've been monitoring the Pixel 3 uh, leaks pretty carefully. Um, the Pixel 3 is <coughs> expected to be announced on um, the, I think, the 9th or the 10th of October. It's usually early October when they tend to announce these. Are you are you uh, planning to get two or three of them and a bathroom to throw it down the toilet as well <laughs> when, when it arrives? Now, hang on. It, it, <laughs> while that may seem like a fair comment, it well, actually is. Because it uh, is. <laughs> I... I'm evaluating what to get next. I'm, I'm wavering a little bit. I won't turn this into uh, into what phone I'm getting because I've been looking at the OnePlus 6 and a few others. But what I think has been interesting is there's... Do you remember um, a, quite a while ago, there was a whole new story about how some Apple employee left an iPhone 4 prototype, I think it was, in mm-hmm. a bar in San Jose. And... Basically, Apple hit the roof about this, and rightly so, and there was a big problem about it. Um, I think what's going on here is one of two things. Either Google are just the leakiest of leaky ships it's when it comes to the Pixel 3. spectacularly incompetent about this and nothing else, by the way. I mean, yeah, no one ever uh, seems yeah. to leave the plans, the, you know, the source code for Google Wave on a floppy disk in a bar. <laughs> <laughs> well, people just leave it in the bar. <laughs> so, uh, I found it and no one cared. Throw it away. To be fair... Apple are quite the opposite of being leaky. And so when something does leak out, like the iPhone 4 did, and it was a massive redesign, whereas the Pixel 3 looks like another glass slab with maybe more pixels on it. I don't know. Right. But the iPhone 4, the, the difference there was Apple are notorious for keeping things secret. Yeah. Um, 
and it was touted around all the news organizations. So the, the person who found it or whoever it was passed to was touting it around trying to get some money for it and a story out of it. And when I think it was Gizmodo um, right. published, that's when Apple hit the roof. Um, well, so what's interesting here is that with the Google 3, like historically with, with the Pixel leaks, it's always been around, you know, they got hold of, people get hold of, um, the schematics for the top, cases, right? right? Templates and, and stuff, right? Yeah, and then and then you'll there's you know people who will will render them, and there's certain people who are known for leaks, such as EV leaks, who will will, will leak various bits and pieces. But it's always been much and much the same. It's been really informed assumptions and guesses around this. The fact that apparently a box of Pixel threes was nicked from a factory, sold on the black market in the Ukraine or somewhere and people have been posting videos and the fact that one was allegedly left in the back of a lift either suggests to me that they have terrible security when it comes to the pixel three or, and this is what I think is the case. You've got two very, very um, capable social media professionals who are almost certainly called Brittany and Chad because <laughs> all social media people are called Brittany and Chad. And what they've done is they've basically archetyped, they've, they've architected this uh, campaign of quote-unquote leaks, and it's complete PR. And it's working. So what happens is, you know, Apple have got their announcement event in a couple of weeks, and then Google are always a little bit behind the tr trail on that in, uh, in, in October. But we're all talking about the Pixel 3 because it's been hitting all of these 9 to 5 Android news sites and Android police and whatever else. And I believe it's completely architect. Now, I, I sound like an Alex Jones conspirator, conspiratorial yes. nutcase yes, when I'm saying this, but could it be that? I mean, I, it just, I, 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 just, I, I can't you. believe that their security is this bad. I agree with you wholeheartedly. If you're going to be, uh, if you're prepared to be open about it, then at some point someone's going to say, why don't we pretend we were going to be closed and then leak it? So everyone runs stories going, oh my God, leaked Pixel 3. What, in all yes. these leaks, uh, forgive me, I ha I, I, all I've seen is the lift story and nothing more. Have there been any revelations about what's new in this device? The, the leaked oh, yeah. lift one was basically a photos of the front and back. And no, so, someone, left, someone left one in the back of a cab. Yeah, the lift. The lift one, but it was photos of the front so, and back. Oh. So Stuart, lift, Stuart, lift is, ah, is, uh, is, 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 it's like taxis, but for the modern era, you can use this application on your cell phone to request a ride and it will appear at wherever you live. That's what a lift I, 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 is, just so you know. As I understood <laughs> it, I believed it appeared somewhere near where you lived and then drove you four times as long as you need to, but you don't have to give them cash, so that makes it better. <laughs> <laughs> but now they expect you to tip them. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so what are the, what are the uh, revolutionary uh, new things in this new device that aren't available in any other phone? There isn't anything. As far no, as well, that's not so entirely true. So why are we that, talking about it? Well, so first of all, John I think... Wants to buy one. Well, well no, I think I think what's happening here is there is there is some new stuff in it. To be fair, like you know the Pixel Three is one of the first ones with a notch, and there's there's dual Sorry, cameras. No, on it's the... not. You uh, go to no one, one of the first Pixels with a notch is oh, what okay. I'm saying. Right, right. So they're, by they're, definition, they're, they're late to the party there because yeah. Lenovo, Motorola, Huawei, and they're always many late others to the pie. have notches. Pixel as well. Pixel is always late to the pie. There's two cameras on the front. There's some internals, which is relatively interesting. There's with wireless charging in it. So it's new yeah. stuff for the Pixel line. If, so yeah, if, do, if, if your question is, what's new in it that wasn't in an iPhone a year ago? The answer is nothing, nothing as far as I can yeah. tell. It is, it is a thoroughly average phone as they've, well, in terms of new shit, but I don't think they ever try to be first with stuff. But my point is, is that the regular yeah. consumers Wire, are not going to go out and charging, know about this. by the way, but that's not new to them either. But at least they'll right. do it. No, but exactly. sorry, carry on, John. But but my point is, is that you know, in many ways, it's kind of a genius PR move because people are talking about it. But the people who are talking about it are the nerds, are phone nerds, because those are the kind of people who are reading Android Police and whatever else. Regular consumers will hear about it when it hits their launch event in October. So well, and yeah. we read this, and and as we've seen from our current political climate across the world, people like to read salacious content, anything to do with leaks or whatever else. So. I, but I'm pretty sure that this is staged. Yeah. But I was. I feel weird for saying it because it does make me sound like Alex Jones. No, I, th I, I think that's a perfectly reasonable thing to believe. And I'm 
I'm quite convinced by your argument. It, just, wow. just because I can't, I'd be surprised if they were this incompetent otherwise. Well, I, yeah. I find it difficult to get excited about Google Pixel phones because they're just another slab. Yes. There's no, like, there's nothing special about them, and they're, they're just like every other slab. Like, you've, you've mentioned the OnePlus 6 that's on your list of things you might be looking at, and there are other phones as well. Yeah. I, I, I just can't fathom what it is. Okay, it's got Google Assistant. Well, they've all got that now, as I understand it. It has a fairly recent version of Android. There's a few other phones, the OnePlus, Nokia, and a few others have that as well. Yeah. I, just, yeah. I just can't fathom what this passion is for the Pixel, other the, than the, the fact reason, that it comes from Google. The only reason why I'm interested in it right now is because I'm in the market for buying a new phone. Right. If, if, yeah. if I, like, so, for example, I paid basically no attention to the Pixel 2 because I had a Pixel. I was not in the market for a new phone. I don't understand how people get excited about cell phones because they're 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 really not changing that 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 much. And all of this whinging about the size of the notch or the size of the chin, most people just don't care about that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, it's just not interesting. I mean, I, I, I can't think of a thing that cell phones, uh, the mobiles have done for the last three or four years that maybe go, wow, I really need that and I don't have it. Right. So I, right. I went from a, uh, I can't remember, oh, the OnePlus X. OnePlus X. That was nice and small yes. for us lady hands yes. kind of guys. Hooray! So the to the OnePlus three T because it had more RAM and I wanted to be able to have lots of things open and not things not be culled while I'm switching yeah. between them because I I switch apps a lot. Now I've got the OnePlus three T. I can't I can't imagine what feature I need in a next phone, which is why I've skipped all the ones since the OnePlus three T. I just can't. Yeah, I'm I'm having real difficulty finding anything like a better camera maybe but yeah it's, it. it's just you know well the camera's now cares? good enough for most people the, yeah. the main feature i need is a phone that's waterproof <laughs> you, you really have you not thought about just ordering it from google and having him deliver it directly to bed bath and beyond and just cut out of the middle <laughs> <laughs> yes pretty much um all right well we're we're about an hour in yes. we should probably do a couple more and then wrap it up yes because, uh, I agree. Pope, so Pope, um, Pope has got the, the Pope has got things to do. A quick one, um, which I just thought was amusing. Um, Twitter decided they were going to stop um, setting things up so you can cross post to Facebook. And yes, it's not entirely clear to me exactly what caused this, but I think it's all tied in with Twitter cutting off third party API access, which has broken every third party Twitter client and. Uh, or, sorry, cutting off some parts of third-party API access and so on. Um, but what was amusing was Twitter therefore removed their registered Facebook app. They had a Twitter app registered at Facebook. So they removed that, at which point every single cross-posted tweet was deleted from Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> It was. I wonder, I wonder yeah. who was the first person to spot that well, and what their reaction was when they when they saw the data had gone. Yeah, it has now been fixed, presumably because someone at Twitter picked up the phone and rang someone at Facebook and went, ah, sorry, please restore from a backup or something. Um, so first of all, there's a kind of, but if I deleted my Facebook app and it deleted all the stuff, they wouldn't listen to me and put it all back. That's really annoying. But I'd just like to imagine whoever it was who went, fine, we can just delete that. We don't need it anymore. And then, you know, that kind of cold feeling of despair when you realise you've done something wrong and irreversible. <laughs> or, well, it depends on, the, it depends on the person, doesn't it? Whether they actually just went, oh, well, fuck it. <laughs> it's gone now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They are now back anyway, but I just thought it was... So this is why, Jono, when you were like, has it? No, not anymore. They're back again. But, I think this oh, okay. actually highlights the complexity of modern applications. Yeah. It's very hard to know, like when all you're doing is pressing a button that says OK, cancel. Like in the old days, you'd press a button and you know, I am saving a text file on a disk. Now there's so many thousands of layers of abstraction and so many interconnected things. You press a button, you've got no idea the myriad of things that happen out there in the wide world. So I'm not yeah. surprised something like this was bound to happen. I mean, banging on about, um, you know, remember people banging on about intertwingularity a few years ago where everything was connected to everything else and so on, and that was a really cool, desirable thing. Kind of. But maybe in retrospect, maybe we didn't want to weave everything in with everything else, so we've got no idea no. what the hell no. is going on. Not, not yeah. when Jim, the new intern, is tasked with deleting the app from Facebook, no. <laughs> yes. Um, do we have anything else? 
you have anything? Uh, I have one. Okay. We can maybe touch on briefly. So um, I'm going to read some of this from the uh, <coughs> from this article I read. According to, to a Microsoft Commission survey, 50% of parents in the U.S. with kids aged 18 or under uh, believe that coding and computer programming is to be the most beneficial subject to their child's future employability uh, compared to foreign languages primarily, which are at 28%. Uh, from the Microsoft Education blog post, they said, when asked about the technology industry's involvement, 75% of parents said that they believe big tech companies should be involved in helping schools build kids' digital skills. And many companies such as Microsoft and organizations like Code.org are working to do just that. So I thought this was interesting. Like one theory that I've had, and we've talked about on, on Bad Voltage a bunch, is that is that coding in schools is going to become a more and more prominent thing. Um and it's good to see that being validated somewhat because I think still it's primarily, you know, a lot of relatively tech savvy parents see the value of that. But right. it seems like this say, is becoming more and more of a thing. Is this was this survey conducted in the greater Seattle and downtown Silicon Valley areas? Ah, well, right. not necessarily because I have an interesting counterpoint to this. Um, they, they they went um, so uh, a whole bunch of places have reported on this, but I read it in the Independent. Um, a thing where CEOs of major tech companies tend to restrict their children's access to technology. So Steve Jobs did it, Bill Gates does it, Zuckerberg does it. They all keep their kids away from tech and want them to read books. I believe that. Um, isn't isn't that now? Now I, I'm quite prepared to believe that you say, okay, people need to learn digital skills, skills at school, so they can go out and get a job, which is less of a problem if you stand to inherit 165 billion dollars, but <laughs> probably don't right. need a job. But I thought it was interesting that you've got tech companies, you know, surveys saying. Um, People should be learning technology at school, and um, big tech companies should be involved in that. But the people who run those big tech companies are like, no, I don't want my kids involved with it. I don't think they're saying that. Ah, I think you're conflating a few things. Oh, wow, which is I don't, th- I, don't, I don't think that big that using your example of big tech companies restricting their kids' uh, screen time is, I don't want my kids involved in this. I don't think restricting screen time involves restricting a hundred percent of coding development screen time. Um, <laughs> also, I think surely the majority of parents restrict it. It's just the degree to which they just restrict it. Like some parents are at one end where the kids have free reign to use a digital device, whatever that is, and they can put whatever apps on there and play games and watch videos and all that. And then you've got the people at the other end who live in a hut and they don't have any digital devices. And there are people, a myriad of choices in between where exactly they, where they have a limited amount of screen time or n- like only a certain number of hours a day or maybe only certain applications and no social media and everywhere in between and i think these ceos just fall in the very aware of the impact of these things region yeah. of that that scale that that's yeah. fair i mean i'll be honest with you this is not something i particularly had to address because my daughter's too old right by the time um this sort of discussion became a thing. No one ever particularly worried when we were kids about limiting our access to computers or whatever, because there's only so many times you can write more basic programs right, before the you only, go nuts. The only, the only thing I got told was you'll get square eyes if you sit that close well, to the telly. Well, exactly. Right? <laughs> so, That's medically proven. So, there's an article on Mayo Clinic. Yeah, can I just point out I'm the only one of the three of us who doesn't have square eyes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but the idea that, um, that too much screen time is actually damaging, not in a you'll get square eyes point of view, but in the way you view the world and should you step away and digital detoxing and all this kind of thing that we have discussed quite a lot before. That's a relatively recent thing, and it came along with ubiquitous ownership of mobile phones, even by young children. And by the time we got to the stage where that was normal, my daughter was like 16. So my son messaged me via WhatsApp from his Android device at another location yesterday and said, hey, can I have an Instagram account? Uh, and I said, uh, no, um, <laughs> not, not for any other reason than I don't allow you to have an app or a service if you just message me and ask for it. We're going to have to have a discussion and a conversation about how you use it and limits and all that kind of stuff. How, how old is your son? Uh, he'll be 12 uh, next yeah. week. 
Uh, that would be weird to me, having a kid that uh, that young on Instagram. Uh, well, so my daughter had it at this age, which was one of the things, pieces of evidence that he, he said, well, Sophie, right, yeah. Sophie had it when she was my age, but she got it when she was in pantomime and all the other dancers um, that were in the, the pantomime uh, production all had it and they all got friends over Instagram and she signed up without me knowing. Uh, uh. So... She got it that way. Um, I wouldn't have allowed it at the time, but she's yeah. got it now and uses it a lot. But it's, um, I, you know, having having children of that age where they do sit on their phone all the time, a lot of the time, yeah, um, I can see why people do limit oh, their access. To, totally. I mean, to there's um, there's a book uh, called The Smart Girl's Guide to Privacy by Violet Blue, which you is can get it on your Kindle. Written for. Um, uh, teenage girls, essentially. Mm -hmm. Practical tips for staying safe online, which I bought for Neve when she was about 12, I think. And it was really good. But at that point, that was she was quite a trailblazer in terms of actually talking about this sort of thing. Now it's, it's much more part of the zeitgeist. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, it's, yeah. it's going to be interesting to watch um, you, Jono, because you're yeah. those few years behind... Exactly. Again. Yeah, it's, I'm curious to see what it's going to be like for Jack because obviously he's completely grown up in this era. So uh, yeah, he's entirely unaware of a world which doesn't have a GPS device in everyone's pocket. It, it never right. ceases to amaze me that when I when I wanted to play computer games with my friends, I had to take my computer to my friend's house, whereas <laughs> Sam can sit down at a computer here and <coughs> log into Discord and have voice chat with his mates who are anywhere in the world and play video games with them online shooting other people in the face or whatever it is they do um it, things have just moved on i i i have no idea what it'd be like when jack gets to sam's right. age and like in six seven years time and right things change again Presum no presumably he'll be able to play um play all the same games but sitting in the back of your flying cadillac right <laughs> <laughs> or, or, well, or possibly the... we'll have just uploaded ourselves into pure energy on on the internet version four or something <laughs> <laughs> well given the fact that uh, the three of us earlier on were just uh, wowed in how cool it was to zoom into old maps. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if we're necessarily the ones to be commenting on the kids of the day. <laughs> there, do, there, there does seem to be a certain amount of you know certain amount of discontinuity going on. Here, <laughs> nice. Well, shall we wrap it up? Yes, then? we shall. Um, we should say thank you very much. Thank you, Popey. Uh, no worries. Uh, Lovely was... to be here. Always a pleasure. Yes. Always a pleasure to have you on the show. And let's try and get you on at some point when Jeremy's on as well, because you're usually a stand-in. So. <laughs> but, yeah, I know our listeners always enjoy having you on, as do us. And, uh, uh, you know, yes, people um, go and do, do we want to give comments. Him, do we want to give him nine seconds to uh, talk about his own yeah. podcast? <laughs> just so, yeah, yeah. Uh, go on, shill uh, it. Just so people who listen to Bad Voltage and don't get the opportunity to listen to you again. Tell us about your podcast and Snappy. Yeah, we're, um, every week uh, Ubuntu Podcast comes out and you can find out ubuntupodcast.org and that's it. Excellent. You wow. should listen to it. What an advertising professional. It's <laughs> it's it's excellent, uh, especially if you want to know how to rebuild a bathroom, which is surprising content for an Ubuntu podcast, <laughs> but nonetheless. I think uh, we, we uh, rank about 28% uh, Ubuntu content by volume. In the podcast, so it's not a hundred percent. It says Ubuntu on the tin, but it very much isn't Ubuntu in the tin. When you uh, when you were talking about your uh, when you were talking about the the bathroom remodeling on the Ubuntu podcast, was there an out just just an outpour of anger and and annoyance when you decided to move the taps from one side of the sink to the other side of the sink? <laughs> and we also made them brown as well. <laughs> <laughs> right. Never forget. Never forget, people. Never forget. <laughs> right. Thank you very much. Um, that was the show. Layers. I am recording. I am recording. recording. Do you want to intro language? Uh, intro the, the I, wonder and the wisdom that is Pope. Oh, f for God's sake. Is it episode 38?
Fuck knows. The problem is, it's written at the top of the document, but I can never remember whether I've already changed it or not. Hang on. Bad voltage. Wait, do you use one document and just clear it out and start yes. again? Yes. yes. You lazy Before fuck. you joined, there was notes in that document from like three years ago. Yeah. I cleared them all out because I don't want you seeing all the secret things we decided not to do in 2014. <laughs> Um, right, yeah, it is episode 38, so I'm introing, am I? Yes. Okay. This is Bad Voltage, episode... No, I oh, fucked that up already, for God's sake. Sorry, Joe. What a professional. <laughs> what a professional. Jeremy would be proud. <laughs>